Alright, so this video is a little bit different today. It's a bit more of like a unconventional Q&A. The reason I say that is because I get asked these type of questions a lot. The video is actually about things you need to know before you go and do base camp. So last year in September, I decided I was going to go and do Mount Everest base camp. And it's something that my seven year old self always wanted to do. I just never thought it was actually possible. Like it was one of those things that you would write down on your bucket list just because it was a cool thing to do. And then when you actually thought about doing it, it seemed really, really impossible. So when I kind of had the idea and looked into it, I just kind of, I went for it. I didn't even think twice about it. There's things that I wish I'd known before I went. And they're little things that you wouldn't really think about when you're planning a trip like this. Over the last few months, the people that have asked me the questions are kind of cor cor correlated. I've put the questions together and basically questions which I'm going to explain to you today. So the entire base camp experience was probably one of the most rewarding and most humbling experiences that I've ever had in my life. I know when I came back from that trip and people asked me how was it, it was really hard to put into words what I felt when I was over there and it's something that I just wish everybody could experience at least once in their lifetime. If it's been one of those things that you've been thinking about doing for a really long time, and you keep kind of talking yourself out of it, my suggestion is stop thinking and start planning. So let's get into it. I was about to wink and I didn't wink. I didn't really want to look after the organizing of everything because there's a lot of things to actually consider like visas, permits that you have to pay for when you're going through the national parks, when you're on the mountain and just little things like that that could really ruin your trip if you haven't pre-booked it or thought about before you leave. Yeah, I would suggest if it's a first time and you want that peace of mind, do it through a tour group because all that stress and all that planning is actually done for you, you literally just have to show up. I did it through Intrepid Travel, um, but there are so many groups out there that you can go through. So you've got option one, which is plan through a group, because they'll look after everything from permits to visas to flights. Doing it through a tour group also allows you to meet heaps of cool people from different walks of life and all around the world. You could plan it yourself when you get to Kathmandu. There's literally streets and streets of like travel agencies that specifically do base camp tracks. Or you could do it yourself. It just would require a lot more planning. But maybe after this video, you'll be able to do it on your own anyway. Next question. So when I went, I went in September and it was probably the best time of year to go. That's also what our tour guides had said. It is still monsoon season, but right, it's right before peak season kind of starts. There's not a lot of people around. Things don't get quite as expensive as they would in peak season. Peak season is October to November, December. So there's a major, major influx of tourists on the mountain, meaning the prices as you go up get more and more expensive. Also, I think one of the really good things about going in September and kind of off-peak season is that the places that you stay at, they tend to get pretty lenient because they haven't had people come and stay with them for a while. Sometimes you'll get away with paying for things a lot cheaper or sometimes for free, basically. Like we stayed in a few places where they just kind of gave us a Wi-Fi password and we didn't have to pay for it. September's probably the perfect time to go if you're planning a trip. They do suggest, and when I say they, I mean literally the locals and the tour guides, not going in March to August because it is freezing cold. Temperatures can drop to minus 30 degrees, and a lot of the people that live in those villages as you get up on the mountain, they actually evacuate. I wanna say that again. They evacuate because it's just way too cold. So you might find that there will be no one around. If you go through a group like Intrepid or any tour group, the treks normally go for about 17 to 20 days. They kind of vary depending on how many days you have to stay to climatize in certain places. No matter how long you're deciding to go for, whether that is 17 days, 20 days, whatever, make sure you allow two days on either side of the actual trek because things like flights can change if the weather's really bad, like they will, there will be a no-fly zone. You don't want to miss any connecting flights or flights leaving back home. So always give yourself the two days on either end of the track. 
I would still suggest taking the 17 days or even three weeks to complete the actual trek itself, mainly due to acclimatizing on the way up. On the way up, we stayed two nights in Namshi Bazaar, which I would highly recommend because it's the last biggest kind of village or town before you get to absolutely nothing. And we also stayed two nights in Dimboche. Make sure during those acclimatizing days, you do still go for a walk. If you go up and then come back down and sleep, that's how you actually acclimatize. This is going to depend on whether you are doing this whole trip on your own or if you do it with a tour group. September, because it's kind of off-peak season, is probably the cheapest time to go, whereas if you were to choose to go in the months of or November to December, it could be a bit more expensive. Flights are expected to be anywhere between $700 to $1,000 from Melbourne to Kathmandu. We flew China Southern, so we actually got the tickets for about $800, I think, return from Melbourne to Guangzhou, Guangzhou to Kathmandu. Make sure you have smaller change because it comes in handy when it comes to tipping the porters, the restaurants, the places that you stay at. Tipping is one of those things, it's a respectful thing to do in their culture. Even if you do go through a tour group, you will still be expected to tip the porters, the guides, and any assistants. So to give you a rough idea of how much tipping you should be doing, porters are roughly $1 to $2 a day. Assistant guide is roughly about $3 to $4 a day. And your leader who's taking you on the group is roughly about $4 to $5 a day. Culturally though, if you were to do this whole trip on your own and you did have just a porter and a guide, you'd be expected to kind of pay for their accommodation, their food. It may seem like a lot now, but when you get there and you see how these people live and the lengths that they have to go to to just carry food up the mountain, don't be a tight ass, tip generously, because they're looking after you too, so don't be a gypsy. The visa on arrival is 50 USD dollars. Do the visa when you get to Kathmandu. Do not, and I'm gonna say it again, do not do the visa here in Australia or Canada or wherever you're from. It is way too expensive here in Australia. It would cost you close to about 220 Australian dollars, which is just ridiculous. The lines can get really, really, really long. I know when I went, I was waiting almost an hour and a half because there was only one machine working to fill out the forms. Do it all before you go, just pay for it on arrival because it will only cost you 50 US dollars. Do not, I will repeat again, do not drink the water anywhere in Nepal. We actually got a water filter um, it was like a little pouch bag thing that you top up and fill up and then squeeze into your reusable water bottle. And that's another thing to be conscious of. Plastic bottles suck, especially when you're on a mountain. Those water pouches you can pick up for about 30 to 40 Australian dollars. It will last the entire trip. Otherwise you can buy water, but like I said, try to avoid that because plastic, money. Another alternative is you can actually buy these things called life straws, which are about $50. You pretty much just stick the straw into your bottle or glass or whatever, and it filters through the water. So they're 100% safe. We had someone in our group use it, and they were fine. They didn't get sick. They were literally filling up the water from a lake and using the straw, and they were totally fine. Another alternative is also the tablets that you put in the water, and I wouldn't recommend buying them in Kathmandu. I would buy them at a pharmacy or chemist. So option number one is the water filter pouch. Option two is a life straw. Option three is buying water, which probably wouldn't recommend. And then there is the water-soluble tablets that filter the water and clean it out for you. And new. I think altitude sickness and the locals who take you on the tours will tell you that it's just one of those things that can happen to anybody. You could be the fittest person on the planet, you could even do altitude training and still get sick. It affects everybody differently. There was one person who did altitude training in our group and he actually was the only one who ended up getting really sick. So, and to be honest with you, I think, and this is a personal opinion, doing something like this trek was more mentally challenging than it was physically. 
Resilience and endurance are probably the two things that will pull you through. And again, that's just a personal opinion. I think what you'll start to see as you begin the trek is that you'll take three steps and you'll be out of breath. The best advice I can give you in regards to altitude training and altitude sickness is don't be a hero. Listen to your body. If there's times where you need to stop and breathe, do that. There were times where I would take four to five steps and be completely out of breath. It felt like I just ran a marathon when all I did was climb up a little rock. So for me, the biggest things were concentrating on my breathing and hydration. Seven liters of water was what I was drinking and you will need it. I'm telling you now, water is water and breath and breathing correctly is what helped me get through the whole trek without getting sick once. Before you even start walking for the day, you drink two liters of water before you walk out the door. Whilst you're walking, I had one of those camel packs in my backpack, so I ended up drinking about two liters whilst I was walking until we got to the next stop. And then before you go to sleep, again, about one to two liters at least. No, I didn't. The only thing I took on that whole trek was Nurofen. I'm not a doctor, but any means, but Diamox is a blood thinner, as I learned on that trek. So it allows your red blood cells to grab and hold onto more oxygen, which is why people take it. If you feel the need to take them and you're a bit worried, by all means take them. Again, do not recommend buying them in Kathmandu. I would stick to getting a consultation from a doctor and getting them to prescribe you something. I freaking loved the food in Nepal. Like, honest to God, if you're a vegan, you will be absolutely fine because all they eat is like potatoes, veggies, and dal. As you get higher and higher up on the mountain, food gets more and more bland. Even the locals will recommend not eating the meat. One, you don't know how long the meat has actually been there because on off seasons, they tend to just freeze everything. But, so when you see things like yak steak, I don't know how long that yak steak has been sitting there. So foods that you need to try, Sherpa stew is like a must. The dal bart, and the thing with dal bart is it's their national dish. So if you do order it, you actually end up getting free refills. So if you're super, super hungry, I would actually suggest getting that because you'll get a refill. The garlic soup, they actually recommend and say that help it helps with like stomach bugs and altitude sickness as well. So that was actually really, really good. Don't eat meat on the mountain or eggs or cheese or anything like that because yeah, you don't know how long it's been there for. Try and eat vegetarian most of the trip because you won't get sick that way. And try dal bart, sherpa stew, and the garlic soup. So they recommend that you bring 40,000 rupees. Oops. It ends up being about 522 Australian dollars or 346 USD. So that's to cover your food and snacks and toilet paper, whatever, anything you need. On food alone, you're expected to spend about 30 to 40 USD a day. So it ends up working out to be $10 a meal. A bottle of water by the time you get to the top can cost you anywhere between seven to $12 for a liter bottle. Um, which is where I recommend you buying a filter or a life straw because seven liters of water a day, it literally could end up costing you about like 70 bucks of water for a day. A packet of Pringles can end up costing you about 500 rupees, which is literally $7. And things like Oreos or Mars bars and Snickers, they can cost you anywhere between $5 to $7. One last thing, just in regards to food that I forgot to mention earlier, make sure you check the back of the packets of things like chips and chocolates and stuff because I actually ended up buying a packet of Oreos that was dated back from 2017. I still ate them, but I wouldn't recommend doing that. Namshi Bazaar is the last major town that you'll pass as you're going up and they have, they have heaps of ATMs and banks. I would recommend taking out more there 
There is one last ATM and it's literally the highest ATM in the world. When you pass through Kumjung, chances are that there won't be good enough signal for you to actually get money out. So to be safe, I would recommend taking it out at Amshi Bazaar. If you have 40,000 rupees, you'll be fine. Like if you're spending more than that, like what the hell are you buying? You pretty much end up paying for absolutely everything on that mountain. Once you pass the Amshi Bazaar, everything is just solar powered and things like hot showers are going to cost you money. They end up costing you about 500 rupee, which is about 7 to 10 Australian dollars. You probably won't be showering that frequently. I didn't shower for like 16 days, as gross as that sounds. Wi-Fi as well, the signals aren't amazing. Even to charge your devices can cost you anywhere between 200 to 500 rupee. Bring a portable charger or a power bank. Be mindful though of the airline that you're traveling with because when we traveled with China Southern, they actually took out our portable chargers from our check-in baggage. If you're really tech savvy, I would actually suggest, and I didn't actually realize this until I got on the mountain and I saw people with them, solar power charging banks. You can basically use them anywhere and then while you're walking on the trek you just tie it to your backpack. If the sun's out you will be able to charge your own devices with a solar powered power bank. That's a really good tip. Okay, there's a lot of like little mini tips that I can give so I'm just going to kind of combine these. I obviously this was my first time doing base camp so I had no idea what to expect. I had no idea what to buy. I went off other people telling me what to buy in blogs and vlogs and what the travel agent was telling me to do but I ended up buying absolutely everything I needed here in Australia which ended up costing me a lot of money from the backpacks to the jackets to the all the other shit in between. I recommend buy a backpack and then buy everything or hire everything in Kathmandu where you get, when you get there. Everything that you'll specifically need for this trek. You do not need to go spend thousands upon thousands of dollars on top of the line jackets and top of the line equipment because chances are you probably won't even use them. Hire everything, whether that's a down jacket, a sleeping bag in Kathmandu because you will save hundreds of dollars. When you get to Kathmandu airport, if you do want to buy a SIM card, they're super cheap. I think I picked one up for like 30 bucks and I had unlimited internet and calls and whatever. But NCEL, that is NCEL, is probably the best service you can get there. Um, and it's probably the most reliable when you're on the mountain. Toilet paper is really freaking expensive on the mountain. If you're gonna stock up on anything in Kathmandu, make sure you stock up on toilet paper. In terms of packing, I think packing clothing that is dry fit so if you were to wash it whilst you're you know staying overnight somewhere you can dry it quicker it's just easier it's lighter to carry and you know if you need to dry it you can always tie it to your backpack and while you're walking it'll dry by the time you get to your next destination the best piece of advice I can give you if you're prone to blisters is wear two pairs of socks I wore like a thinner pair of socks and then a thicker pair of socks every day when I was walking and I had no blisters. I didn't even wear my boots in. One other tip that I got told before I left and it was really, really, really cool to experience is when you fly out from Kathmandu to Lukla, make sure you sit on the left side of the plane because that's where you'll get the best views of the Himalayas. It is the most amazing and liberating feeling and sight to see when you're coming up through the clouds and all you see are just those mountain tops. So that of all the things I've told you and all the recommendations I've given you, that is probably the best one. Sit on the left side of the plane. Not a lot. Just be smart about what you pack. I've kind of told you to pack dry fit clothes that can dry really quickly, that are super light. Good suitable hiking boots. I bought mine from North Face for $140 and I had no issues with them. They were amazing. I didn't even need to wear them in. I mean, you don't need to go all out and buy $200 pairs because it's not necessary. Just make sure they're waterproof and they're comfortable. That's the main, 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 main thing. You need baby wipes because they will come in handy when you haven't showered in 16 days. I'm telling you now, stock up on baby wipes. But yeah, my advice to you is if you're thinking about doing it, stop thinking and start doing and start planning. And I really hope that this video answered some of your questions. 
As always guys, thank you for watching this video and getting through it all. Um, if you liked it, let me know. Tell me your thoughts. Remember to hit the subscribe button. And I will see you next week. I almost linked, but I didn't. Now I'm doing awkward thumbs up. Oh god.